Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. And this week we have a guest. My friend Shannon is here. It's going to kind of be like a little Microsoft get together. Shannon and I actually started at Microsoft. We were at the same orientation day right. one. Yeah, same time. And so uh, he's still there. Um, <laughs> and he, Roll and, changes, uh, but yep, still there. He's going to talk to us a little bit about Azure AD joining our machines. So Shannon, why don't you give a little introduction about yourself and uh, what you're up to now? Sure. Um, so I actually started out doing a lot of uh, consulting work uh, prior to coming to Microsoft. So I spent many years working at a Microsoft partner, um, doing a whole bunch of different things, ranging from infrastructure and security, endpoint management, mostly in the deployment and, and Azure AD Intune side. We actually had a team of people that owned configuration manager and um, more of the conventional management at that point. Um, so I spent a lot of time with Azure AD even back then. Um, then come into Microsoft as a uh, uh, endpoint management and, and uh, device uh, TSP. So working with things like uh, Windows and modern management and, and Intune and Autopilot there. Now I'm actually on the Microsoft Managed Desktop Engineering Team. Um, I'm on the Customer Acceleration Team or CAT, um, where I work with customers on deploying modern management as part of the MMD uh, solution offering. Great. So we've had a few episodes on modern management and we've dropped different terms like hybrid Azure AD join and AD join and, and Azure AD join. And so I know you have a, a really nice blog about device management and device identity, which we'll put in the show notes. But mm -hmm. as part of that, why don't you just give an intro on the differences of the range of configurations, you know, that spectrum from domain join being on one end and then Azure AD join on the other and the different states of, of management. Sure. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of conversations that I go into that kind of cover the, the topics of um, co-management comes up a lot, right? Being able to manage devices with both Intune and configuration manager. And a lot of customers are coming in already managing devices with config man. And so um, they're kind of looking at how they do co-management and they see the Azure AD device identity as being kind of a, well, it is a prerequisite for co-management. And so a lot of them come in wanting to do hybrid join because they see co-management and they think hybrid join is a prerequisite to doing that. Um, kind of leaving alone the fact that Azure AD join is an alternative for the device identity. So what I think we'll, we'll probably focus more on today is really the device identity piece of it. But most of the time that conversation is born out of a need for things like co-management um, or remote and off network management of devices that are really corporate owned. And hybrid join is like the main thing that people come to think of because they're coming from a domain joined world. So if you look back at just device identity, we have devices, uh, Windows devices that are joined to an Active Directory domain. and, and you know, why would you even do that? The, the whole point of joining the device to a domain is largely for centralized identity. And in many cases, for the user that's on the device, right? The users who want to log into that device are using accounts that are in Active Directory. And so to log into those machines without having to create an account on every device individually, you join the device to Active Directory, and then that user from AD can sign into any device that's joined to the domain which includes not only their workstation, but their servers too, which is why you can access things like file shares and print servers and websites and all the things that we've come to know as single sign-on advantages in, in domains, right? So when we're looking at having these, these devices, we're just kind of accustomed to the fact that the workstations they're on are joined to the Active Directory domain. And so when we start talking about things like Azure Active Directory, we want to take those machines that we have and extend them into Azure AD because there's other advantages that you get out of attaching the machine to Azure Active Directory. And so that natural extension of trying to do hybrid is where people kind of start. And then Azure AD is a, a new identity relationship that a device can have independent of AD. So that doesn't mean that the user is actually 
a whole different account because people take Active Directory on-prem and they synchronize it with Azure AD. So the user technically has two accounts, one in AD, one in Azure AD, and then Azure AD Connect synchronizes that user identity between those two places. So to the end user, it's the same thing, right? The same username, same password, same experience for you know credential entry and signing into the devices. But what's different is that the, the user can really be authenticated against one place or the other. And there's all kinds of other stuff. I'm sure you've, I've heard you guys talk about all the different authentication mechanisms and synchronization and ADFS and all the other ways you might do it. But suffice it to say, under the covers, regardless of how authentication happens, there really is two accounts, one in AD and one in Azure AD, and the synchronization is what keeps the two acting like one. On an Azure AD joined machine, um, the, the account for the computer only lives in Azure AD. And for a domain join machine, it only lives in Active Directory. So when you sign into a domain join machine, you need a user account that's in Active Directory. And when you have an Azure AD join machine, you need a user account that's in Azure AD. Now, because the user accounts are synchronized, the users can really sign into either one with the same account from their perspective, right? So the machines that are hybrid joined is where things get confusing because people think it's a third and new way, but it's really a domain join machine. It, it's not different. The machine is still joined to Active Directory and the user that signs into it is authenticating with their Active Directory user account. So that means that the machine has to talk to AD to authenticate the user trying to sign into it. So that means in an Active Directory domain join machine and a hybrid joined machine, the dependency on Active Directory persists. There is no change to hybrid join in terms of authenticating the user on the device. There are a lot of advantages that you get out of doing hybrid join of the machine, which is why if you've already got domain join machines, they should totally be hybrid joined. Um, you get things like the ability to use conditional access, right? You can do co-management with Intune in addition to Configuration Manager. Um, you get a, a variety of other things like uh, single sign-on to web apps that are behind Azure AD, right? So M365, Office 365, Teams, third-party stuff, Salesforce, whatever you're putting behind Azure AD, web single sign-on is all there. So hybrid join has a lot of end user experience advantages, but the user account is still being validated against the domain and that, that tether to the Active Directory or CorpNet remains, right? The machine has to talk to DCs to get group policies. They have to talk to the DCs to get user Kerberos tokens, tickets. All of those things still remain. So if you are trying to do things like provision devices off network, um, you want to provision devices at home, <laughs> you want to be off network for a period of time, um, and you want to manage them remotely, you still have that that boat anchor that ties you back to the corporate network and VPN for the most part to, to solve that. With Azure AD, the, the identity of the device changes. So instead of having to have the device call back to Active Directory and talk to a domain controller for tokens, tickets, security group memberships, and all that stuff, it actually talks to Azure AD. So Azure AD is where all the authentication happens. And because the communications between um, Azure AD and the device is done over HTTPS, right? It's, it's using TLS 1.3. Um, and it's encapsulating all of its traffic in a secure tunnel, uh, but it doesn't do network level device VPN tunneling to Azure AD. It's the authentication channel is secured. So you don't have network dependencies in terms of getting to CorpNet for authentication. Uh, you can do things like connect Azure AD to Active Directory using like pass through off uh, ADFS and other mechanisms where the actual authentication and authorization does occur in Active Directory, but it does it kind of via Azure AD, right? The device talks to Azure AD, it then reaches down to the domain controller to get the authentication and authorization completed and hands the token back down to the device. So if the if the challenge is I have to have auth in AD because that's where all my monitoring logs or whatever is happening, you can do that. I wouldn't necessarily say that's, you know, the end all be all great idea, <laughs> but you, you can accomplish it. Um, but the, the primary differences for me between the hybrid join or domain join machine and the Azure AD join machine is where the device identity lives. Um, 
If it's domain joined or hybrid joined, it's tied to AD. You've got that network requirement. You got to do that. If it's Azure AD joined, the device uh, identity is an Azure AD. But the user account is actually synchronized between the two identity systems. So you don't lose the ability to leverage that user credential in either place on either scenario, right? So if I am a domain joined machine, or I'm on a domain joined machine and I go whack whack file server name, if I can resolve its name and I can route to it through VPN or locally or over Wi-Fi, guess what? Windows authenticates the user against the domain controller, you get access. If I'm an Azure AD joined machine, and I go whack whack file server name, and I can resolve the name, and I can route to the, the host, I'm going to be able to authenticate against that endpoint, get access to the resource. And if you've used a username and password, like you do on a domain joined machine, if you use a username and password on an Azure AD joined machine, guess what? Single sign-on still works. You still resolve it, you get the token, you, you get access to it. That's not even magic. That's actually just how Windows works with, say, with cached credentials on the machine when you have access to main resources. So, there's a lot of really uh, fundamental uh, behaviors of an Azure AD joint machine that aren't really that different in terms of user experience on, uh, on Azure AD versus hybrid or domain joint machines. That actually makes Azure AD really palatable to, to use and try, but I think people misunderstand um, the severity of that device identity difference uh, and how that difference impacts the end user, which is usually not that much. It's more about management and, and understanding the, uh, the capabilities of you know, reaching out to the device and, and how you put policies on it, which is not about identity anymore. <laughs> That's about like managing the device with Endpoint Manager or Intune or ConfigMan, even group policies. Those are totally different um, topics independent of identity. They're definitely related, but I don't know. Does that answer your question? I went way out into the weeds on... <laughs> <laughs> the two things. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. There's a couple of things I want to just highlight that you said, Shannon, because they, they jump out to me that are really important to kind of land with our listeners. Mm -hmm. And number one, most important thing to take away from what Shannon just got done talking about. Notice the phrase he used over and over and over again. He said device identity. And Sometimes I get pedantic about the words we use, but when we're trying to explain really complex topics, it's helpful if we use consistent language. So this is how we differentiate when we're talking about the device identity and the relationship it has to a directory versus how we are managing the device, which as Shannon mentioned is a related subject, but it's not the same thing. And there is some dependencies, but there are some not dependencies there where you can make the decisions independent of each other as well. Yeah. So that's one thing to land. I, I think another thing you said, and, and we've been kind of hammering on the show a little bit, but I'll, I'll land one more punch here, is you talk through how domain join systems and hybrid jo hybrid joined as well, they all have that dependency on CorpNet. Yeah. And as we have done a mass experiment over not living on CorpNet for the last 12 months, <laughs> yeah. architecting a system with that dependency in 2021 seems bananas to me. And so mm -hmm. I think to everyone listening to the show, I, I I don't know what more push you need than that to start evaluating alternative options because that that is not a dependency I'd want to be building a system around anymore. I would want to be removing that dependency as fast as I could. Um, those are the two things that jumped out at me. Andy, was there anything else you wanted to mention on top of what Shannon just talked about? Yeah, I just want to say, you know, when people at an enterprise are looking at this whole new method of device management. First off, I do want to say that uh, I, I like how Shannon, you put it where the identity is kind of why we do what we do with, with these things where uh, why you domain joined a, a, a machine to begin with is because the identity lives in active directory. And so I've never thought of it like, like that. I, I always thought of it because of how you want to manage the machine and apply group policy and, and, and do those sorts of things. But it makes sense that, that was the initial reason why we domain join in. So um, yeah. the identity is where we want to focus. Yeah. The other I mean, things. I see that a lot when, um, when people are, are trying to understand things like, like device identity and joining, like what, what is the underlying reason to kind of do it in the first place? You know, w if you go back far enough, when AD wasn't a thing, all we had was work group machines. And, and if you look at like the blog post that I talked about, I kind of went over a bunch of different device identity methods, right? When a Windows machine used to ship, 
it basically came out in what we would call a work group mode, right? And, and work group was basically consumer. It was meant for you to create a local account. And in that local account, you could then create a work group and work group kind of allowed sharing between Windows devices. And that was that was okay. It, it did its thing, like Windows for work groups 311, remember that? If, <laughs> if you go back far enough, that's where it started. And it wasn't centralized identity, right? It, it was different devices that had accounts on each that you'd create with the same usernames and passwords on each and you'd happen to authenticate against it. To, to be totally honest, man, if you take a, an Active Directory account, right? Say, make a make an account in AD, call it user3, because we've all been using one and two already. So use with user3 and make a password called password4bang, because you need a bang. And then you can create a account on your machine, that's a local account, called user3 with password bang, right? And when you sign into your local machine with that username and password, because the name and the password matches the name and the password in Active Directory, you can go whack whack domain name and get single sign on. And that's because when you sign into the machine, you've cached the authentication credentials inside of Windows. And when it goes against the domain controller to try and resolve um, your authentication to see what groups and stuff you're in, Windows does this really great thing where it tries to sign in to the domain with the user account creds that you used on Windows. So you've signed in with the username and password, Windows saves it and says, whenever you access a resource, I'm gonna to attempt to use those credentials so that you don't have to be bothered human by my, you know, my petty requirements for credentials. <laughs> so what I'll do is try to sign in. Now, that effectively is what's happening with Azure AD joined machines when connecting to a domain resource. Because if you sign into an Azure AD joined machine with a username and password, Windows caches it like it always has. And then when you access that resource, it attempts to use those credentials and gives you single sign-on. So again, it's not magic, right? We're not tricking the system, doing anything special for Azure AD joined machines. A workgroup computer that you've signed in with the same username and password with will give you single sign-on to a domain as well. Now, because you're signing in with an Azure AD account that has the same username and password in it, you're kind of automatically doing that without the craziness of creating a local account, right? Um, but if you were to go like a file share off of like your phone using the files app on iOS, or maybe you're using a Linux machine or something, again, if you can resolve the name through DNS and you can route to it through IP, you can provide credentials against that domain resource and access it. Now, the, the ACLs, the, the access controllers that are uh, controlling access to the resource on that domain file share, they're tied to the user account. They're not tied to the device. I haven't found anybody who uses uh, device-based access controls, and I'm sure we'll find somebody now that I've said that, but <laughs> you, I've never seen it, right? It's always against the user and what group the users are in. So who cares what device you come from at this point for Active Directory domain resources? It's about the user. And when you are using that Azure AD join machine, you're signing in with the name that's synchronized and you get single sign-on. Now, we should, we should probably caveat everything that I've said by clarifying that I said sign in with a username and password, right? And we can segue into uh, a Windows Hello for Business because on an Azure AD join machine, when you do the join, today anyway, uh, you, you tend to get prompted for a username and password and you authenticate against Azure AD. And then that joins the device and then walks you through the enrollment process for Hello for Business. Hello and Hello for Business are two different things, right? Hello is the gesture-based unlock of the device. Hello for Business is the authentication protocol against Azure AD that the device uses. But what's happening is after you've authenticated, you will very likely go forward with authenticating against the device or unlocking the device using hello, which is gesture-based, either a pin, your face, fingerprint, something like that, um, and not your password, which means you're not giving Windows your password anymore. You're giving Windows the hello for business gesture unlock. So now when you've got your Azure AD join machine, you turn it on, it sees your face, it says, hey, that's you, nice looking beard, and you get in. Once you are signed in and you access the domain resource, Windows doesn't have your password to give to Active Directory. So what happens? It just says, you get what's your password, buddy? It prompts you for your password. You enter your password, guess what? Windows caches it and subsequent requests against domain resources use that cache password. So it's not going to be 
single sign-on to domain resources right out of the gate if you use Hello, which I absolutely recommend you do. You should use Hello, Hello for Business, um, but you won't get single sign-on unless you deploy Hello for Business in Active Directory. You, it's not a requirement. That's something that I see a lot of people thinking is, oh, if we do Azure AD join, we have to deploy Hello for Business or we can't get sign-on to domain resources. Patently untrue, not the case. What you don't get is transparent single sign-on um, because you're not providing a password to Windows to give to Active Directory because it only understands passwords. Teach Active Directory Hello for Business and Azure AD Join Machines can give it that token and it can authenticate you just fine. So it, it's incremental, right? You, you don't have to eat the whole hoagie sandwich, just take the bites at a time. One is get a device Azure AD joined. If you want to solve the, the single sign-on user prompt thing, because maybe it's a big deal and it happens a lot for your users and you should deploy Hello for Business, but it's by no means a requirement. It's, it's a good option to have, but not required. So we have- Andy, you said something on the very first show we did, and you had some sort of quote that was something like, the enemy of security is perfect. <laughs> or something to that effect, like good is still an improvement. And it, it, Shannon's kind of talking through something we run into occasionally when we're working with customers is that customers want to solve all of the things right away. And you can still get incre incremental improvements and, and don't let the pursuit of perfection uh, stop you from making progress along the way, because mm -hmm. progress is very rarely a straight line from zero to 100%. Yeah. It has its twists and turns along the way. But if you're still moving forward you're still improving where you're at compared to where you were yeah yeah perfect is the enemy of good is is the statement and uh okay, it, that's it. Ha it happens a lot in security because we have this mindset of we got to get to the state where we're unbreachable or or you know where we can sleep at night but even if you're making inter incremental improvements, it is still an improvement. And yeah, I always wanted to destigmatize adequate. <laughs> like, if something's <laughs> yes. good, that's not bad. If something does what it's supposed right. to, that's not bad. If something, you know, accomplishes the need, why isn't that good enough? Now, you can always do better, and and you should strive to do better. But it doesn't mean that you can't take incremental steps towards better, and keep getting better. Um, and I think the, the journey to Azure AD join um, and things like autopilot and things like, you know, managing devices within Tune, I think a lot of people see that as like the other way to do things. And that other way to do things is just too much to do right now because, well, the world is burning down and I've got stuff I got to take care of. And so what I'm going to do is take this, you know, 20 years of, of work that we've built our business on and we're going to lurch it all forward uh, into this new way of getting things done. And that means, you know, for a lot of people, it's, it's like hybrid join and VPN and, and trying to carry forward with all that and try and understand how to control access to stuff. There are ways to do it. There's lots of tools and solutions and, you know, hybrid join is a piece of that and co-management, even just configuration manager management is part of that. But when we're looking at like new ways to, to deploy devices that are, are less heavy, to be honest, that's part of it, right? Doing the de deployments as people are today worked good in a different scenario, you know, working from the office most of the time. And some places, even just having people working remotely most of the time, but there's only a handful of them that do it. The quantity of people working remotely now kind of demands some attention on how do you do this different? And I think that's probably why a lot of people are watching this particular episode is like they're considering what what's this Azure AD joint thing mean um, and how are we going to deal with it? I, I think there is um, there's a good process that you can kind of go through to figure it out. And it doesn't involve doing it all at once. It involves doing all of it eventually, but you can definitely do it piece at a time and figure out what your next move is, like the specific steps to take. Like for me, I like to tell people the first thing you should do is just take a brand new machine that's running Windows 10 or help take an old machine that's currently running Windows 10 and reset it, right? Go to settings, click reset this PC, remove everything, wipe the machine back to Ubi. What you get then is a machine that's a fresh install of Windows 10 with nothing but Windows and drivers. Take that machine through Ubi and when it boots up, it's gonna prompt you do you want to sign in with your work or personal account? At least if you're running the pro edition of Windows, right? Say work, sign in with your work credentials and that will Azure AD join the machine. The only way that doesn't work is if you've disabled it <laughs> or if you're on a corpnet that blocks it.
But if you're like at home and you're, nobody's really made any changes to defaults in Azure AD, you can just Azure AD join your machine through UBI. That'll be your best experience for getting the device joined. And a lot of people freak out sometimes. They're like, wait, my end users can just Azure AD join the machine? Yeah, guess what? They can also domain join a machine, right? C credentials allow 10 users to, or a, a user to join 10 devices to a domain. So this isn't new either. It's a different system, but you can still join a device to a domain. You can also join them to Azure AD. So boot through Ubi, Azure AD join the machine. And once you're there, figure out what you can and can't do. Like at that point, you got a, a, a tangible thing to figure out, can I do my job? Can I read my mail? which is usually people's first thing. Can I get on Teams or other chat services that you might be using? Can I get to my line of business, uh, third-party apps and things? Are there apps you need to install? Like for me, I, I install GreenShot like right away. <laughs> I use GreenShot for taking screenshots and things. So I go and get that. Um, and then there's other uh, tooling that people use. Find that list of things. Which what I usually find people uh, learn is the first thing they, they can't do um, comes down usually to certificates. They're trying to figure out like, I can't get on Wi-Fi, I can't get on VPN or whatever. And it's because they use cert-based Wi-Fi, which is actually great because Intune can easily push down certificates to managed devices. So once you find that list, I'm not saying fix that right away, but find the list of stuff. Once you've found those things, start taking down the list, what can I fix if I was managing this device? Because just because you've joined the device to Azure AD doesn't mean you're managing it. It's got an identity relationship. So you can do things like, um, you know, can, uh, require it for accessing things with conditional access. You can you know, do a variety of other things. But like the fact that you're signing in with a corporate account um, is, is really what you've accomplished with the join. Once you've done that, then say, all right, now it's time to get the device managed. And you can do that straight out with Intune um, by actually going through the wizard and joining it. What I like to do is go to Azure AD and check the box that says automatically enroll join devices. It's a Windows 10 only setting. People sometimes look at it and they think it's a setting for uh, any device. It's not, it's a Windows 10 setting that when you join Windows 10 devices to Azure AD, it auto enrolls into Intune management. And when that happens, now you've got some tooling and controls that you can push down policies, you can push down apps, you can push down certificates. You can start making configuration changes, running scripts and all kinds of fun stuff. But that's where you start doing the remediation actions of what you learned in step one. So step one is join. Uh, step two is manage. Step three is start to pretty it up, smooth it out, right? You might add autopilot at that point. Autopilot just makes the joining process a little more seamless. Um, and once you've done that, uh, you're in the spot where you start saying, well, who else needs to see this to tell me what I don't know, right? Because maybe I'm the IT person that understands device deployment and management, but I don't understand use cases. Um, then you can start going from there. That process, if you really wanted to, you could go through that process in a day. Uh, just joining the device, incrementally changing things. A lot of places take a lot more time than that, but I think that is a, a logical and easy starting point is to join it, then manage it, then smooth out with autopilot, then worry about what you can and can't do, which might be Group policy settings, right? What am I doing in group policy that I need to put into Intune policies? But that's a whole other line of, of, of conversation that I'll probably go down another rabbit hole. But what, is there a, do you guys do anything different when you're going through the joining or is there a process that you, you recommend people try? Well, what, I, what really resonated with me is the, the you used the word lightness um, when it came to uh, cloud devices. And I'll just tell a brief story when I, when I actually joined Microsoft, I got issued my Surface Book 2. I got it home. I booted it up. And I think the first day, uh, within a couple hours, it had blue screened um, probably <laughs> six or seven times. Yeah. And that is because when, when, we, when we started, Shannon, the, the Surface Books that we were getting were um, being imaged with the corporate image. And yeah. so we got this, you know, like domain joined surface book too that was it was terrible um it had like drivers that were all messed up and it, you know um so i i remember reaching out to um some folks in who were in our role and and they said yeah just just do a um a complete wipe and uh um restart it back up and just azure ad join it and i remember yeah. thinking like I don't know what that means. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what do you mean Azure AD join it? They're like, just, just type mm -hmm. in your name and just go. And yeah. I did that. And it was unbelievable 
the the difference night and day between an Azure AD joined fresh machine versus a image that was just popped on. Yeah, Adam, I, I know that thing. you talk about this quite a bit when it comes to modern operating systems like Apple and Android, where the the apps are just layered on top, right, of the operating system. And Windows is kind of mm -hmm. one of those last bastions where some some people are still having this image versus yeah. uh, like a cloud device, which is you're keeping that vanilla OS and then kind of layering your policies and apps on top, which just makes it a lot cleaner. Yeah, exactly right. I, I, Windows is the last holdout where people still image devices because on other platforms, it's literally not possible. <laughs> you don't bring your iPhone into the company and the IT guy doesn't say, well, let me drop my iOS image on it. You know, you, yeah. you work with the operating system that's there and that's true on um, the Mac was the only other platform where people had like a Mac image and now that's no longer allowed. Macs won't boot unless they're running a digitally signed version of the OS. So you have to layer on top of it in the same way. And, and on the subject of mobile device management and, and relating to a lot of what Shannon just covered, that is exactly how Shannon articulated like just set it up and see what works and what doesn't and iterate. Mm. That is exactly how I tell people to get into mobile device management because people think what they want to do is they need to like get a project manager and build out epics and build out whatever the latest lean agile methodology crap <laughs> is and the way you actually do it is you take an iphone you enroll it in your mdm it gets no policy at first because you haven't deployed anything and you start layering in your policy one at a time does this work yes okay next does mm -hmm. this work next and you just keep wiping that phone re-imaging it and trying what happens again and that's how you actually do it in the real world is you just iterate on it and shannon's right as opposed to just talking about it, just do it and see what works and what doesn't. A lot of this is easily solved. And if it's not, you then have a plan in place for how to get to where you want to be. But the best thing to do is, is as opposed to making it theoretical, make it actual, because Shannon's right. You can absolutely, in, in most scenarios, probably go Azure AD join a device to your org today. And if there's any heartburn about doing that in production, which again, it's not going to impact the rest of your users, so there shouldn't be. But if you do get heartburn, go back to the episode Andy and I did several weeks ago about setting up like a lab environment. You can get a developer instance of Microsoft 365 that includes Intune. It includes everything you need short of Windows licenses to, to start standing that up and building that out there as well. So if you want to do it in a sandbox and break stuff, by all means, go get your developer tenant and, and bang on it. You've got yeah. options for testing this out and getting your hands on with it. So that, that shouldn't be a limiting factor. Yeah. And I, I think you're right that the, the people try to take the approach that they need to uh, examine all of their things before they try it. Um, and, and I understand that, right? Because they're they're used to having this requirement of all the settings and things that are going on in, in their existing devices, and they would they want to carry it forward because it's working for them or has been working for them. But honestly, like mm -hmm. it, if it's working so well for you now, then why are you looking at this, right? Like <laughs> if, if if it was working and you didn't have challenges, then you know maybe you just need to stick with that. But I don't think people are looking at things like autopilot um, because things are working so well. You know, autopilot has been a big driver for the conversation about doing um, different device identity, but it's often overlooked the the significance of the difference between hybrid join and Azure AD join uh, in terms of the ease of deployment. Like if you try and do the deployment of a device that's hybrid joined, you are literally taking all of Active Directory group policies and the existing configuration and all of that, that baggage, that boat anchor of things you've been doing before, and you're adding more to it. it it's not simplifying. It's really not. It's adding more complication to it with a certain goal in mind. And often that goal is to do remote deployment. And so if the goal is to do remote deployment, you can accomplish that with autopilot, but it's far simpler to do if the device is Azure AD joined. That implies then all the other things we've been talking about, which is, well, what will and won't work? And well, how do you figure that out? Well, you don't figure it out by starting by a hybrid joined autopilot deployment. That is not how you figure that out. You're going to struggle with it. 
Um, plenty of customers do it. Don't get me wrong, right? It's it's possible. It's doable. People go through it, but it's a long road and it's tough, and you have to be committed to it to get it done. If you want to take that incremental steps that doesn't involve, you know, the entire company and corporation and backing and funding and partners and ESIF and all that stuff to get it done. If you want to just try it and figure it out, I promise you'll have a better experience going through an Azure AD where you just do the join, find out what you can and can't do and incrementally improve that. At some point, you will get to the stage where you have to figure out what is missing. And at that point, you have actual things to compare as opposed to hypothetical and theoreticals, which are a lot harder to prove and decide what priorities are. If the device is Azure AD joined and Intune managed, we have a, a whole bunch of like baseline policy settings that you can put in place that improve the security of the device. In fact, if you just Azure AD join a machine, even without Intune, just join it, that device will actually have automatic BitLocker encryption turned on and we'll escrow the keys to Azure AD for you. You don't even do anything, you join it and it's done. Now, there's some hardware dependencies for that, but if your machine is like anything younger than five years, you're gonna do it. Uh, so right out of the gate, the device already has an improved security posture from a domain joint machine, just from disk encryption. But there's plenty of other examples that the device is going to have, like you can put a pretty easily update policies in place where the device has a certain cadence of taking Windows updates for quality updates and feature updates. Um, you'll be able to do things like um, maybe take a look at things like Windows information protection. It's far easier to do on an Azure AD join machine managed by Intune. That's a longer road goal, but it's it's actually right in front of you on, on that scenario as opposed to trying to do it with, with traditional management. So. If you, if you really want to spin your wheels and, and get mad at Microsoft, go ahead and compare all of your group policies to Intune. Just like, that's a good way to really get frustrated. It doesn't mean that the settings aren't there, um, but what you're gonna be doing is comparing knobs and levers to knobs and levers, and you're not gonna be asking the questions of like, well, what do these knobs and levers give us, right? What you really need to be doing is coming up with your, your business requirements and not the technical definitions of how you're implementing those business processes. And I'm not even saying you have to come up with those, those business requirements to try it. If you do the Azure AD join and the Intune manage scenario, uh, it's actually a lot easier to come up with like, all right, here's where I am. What does this not meet? What am I missing? Is it, is it reporting? Is it application deployment? Um, is it security hardening? Um, is it monitoring? Like what is, what is it that it's missing? And then you can go after those things much more readily. And, and I think you'll have a much better experience, much more successful project too. A lot of times I think GPO have, there's so many legacy GPOs that people don't even know <laughs> what is being applied, yeah. right? And so I think that's a really good tip to give our listeners is that, you find the gaps, right? Like if, if it is Wi-Fi, maybe Wi-Fi is being de delivered through a GPO, or maybe sure. it is a specific application, or maybe it's a specific configuration. And those are the things then you can scope with an Intune. And there is a, you know, I know you didn't want to go down the rabbit hole, but there, just to mention that there is a group policy analyzer yeah. built into the de uh, endpoint manager. And so you can drop a group policy file in there and it can, basically tell you how to configure a, an Intune policy specific to it. If, that, if yeah. that's like the one thing you need, right? And yeah. you're missing it, you're like, how do I do this in Intune? Yeah. There's a there's a group policy uh, that, analyzer. That tool is actually really useful for that scenario. When you know there's a certain thing that you need and you know you do it in group policy and you want to see if Intune can do that thing, it's a great use of the tool, right? What you do is go into the Active Directory group policy editor, you find the policy you care about and you back it up. And when you back it up, you get this XML file, you go to the Intune portal and you go to the policy analyzer and upload that. And it runs through it and says, here's the like for like settings for the knobs and levers. Now, I promise you're going to find gaps because there are some things that you're just not gonna get an Intune. My favorite example is settings for Internet Explorer 9. You're not gonna find it. So if you've got a policy that's got those settings and you upload it, guess what? Gap. I mean, come on, we're not gonna put those in there. Windows 10 doesn't have it. So it doesn't mean that you're, you should strive for or wait for 100% coverage on policy between uh, group GPO and CSPs, like, cause it's not gonna happen. And it doesn't need to happen is the point. 
what we have found is that somewhere along uh, the 80% mark is what we're seeing of, of policies uploaded to the policy analyzers. We have 80% uh, of what people are uploading. But from the customers that we've worked with and talked with, we're actually hitting about 90, 90 something percent of what they're looking for. So you, if you think about some people's group policies, they have like their general desktop policy that's got like everything in there and they actually don't know what it does. They upload that and they're like, okay, these are the things I care about. Oh, got them, we're good. Um, or we don't and we got to figure out another way. Um, so you have options to deal with it. One is directly through things like uh, Intune policies. We also have uh, the admin templates or ADMX templates that Intune will ingest. So if this policy settings you have are actually uh, ADMX policies, you can actually ingest those and apply those, including third-party things if you needed to do that. There are certain registry hives you can't write to, but you can import those sorts of things to Intune and apply them. And we're adding more and more of those. Um, and then if it really boils down to it, and this isn't my favorite example, but I have had occasions where, you know, you want to set a uh, group policy setting and there's no CSP and there's no template for it. Well, guess what group policy is? Dude, it, it's, it's registry keys. So if you want to flip a registry key, you can write a PowerShell script and take care of it. Like, I'm not saying you should, right? Because you can put it in there. The advantage of group policy is that it enforces the setting and reapplies it upon processing a GPO periodically. You know, a registry key just gets set. Now, if your users are standard users, they won't have access to the hive to change it. So you're in pretty good shape there. Um, but if you really need to do a thing, you can do it in, in other ways. It, it doesn't, it, it's not something that I think people really consider is that there are ways around the shortcomings that they might see. But again, the question is, do you really need it? Should you be doing that? Um, and you only find out once you try. It reminds me of, I, I was just kind of casting shade on Lean Agile a couple of minutes ago, and now I'm going to borrow something from the Toyota way and say, you really should get in the habit of, of asking why, maybe not five whys, but why, why do we need to do this? Well, because we have this now. Okay. But why? Yeah. What's, what's the requirement? Is there, is it regulatory? Is it because InfoSec said so 15 years ago? Like what's, what's the why here and, yeah. and dig into that and, and get better at that because it's something I, I will say I've been fortunate to, to kind of learn since I moved from corporate IT to Microsoft is as customers will come and say, I need to do this you know, I'll ask why. And I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm just trying to understand the need because oftentimes what will happen is customers will say, I need to do this thing. And then they will find a way to solve that. But a lot of times it's not the best way to solve it or the cleanest way to solve it. And since I'm paid to know about the product, I can suggest a better, cleaner, more efficient way to do it. So that's why I'm asking that question. Mm -hmm. And I think this is an opportunity, Andy, you, you piggybacked off Shannon talking about lightness. And so we'll borrow that term again. If our goal is to deliver a lighter touch, more streamlined, modern experience, then we should revisit all of these settings and ask those tough questions of, do we still need them? Is there still value here? Is there still a requirement here? And use this as an opportunity to revisit and streamline our settings on our endpoints as well. This is a great time to do it when you're going through all this. So. Yeah, and a lot of times what happens is there um, people who are looking at this sort of thing, it's because they're really looking for a new way to deploy devices. And I think Azure AD join is actually the, the right thing to consider in deployment scenarios. So I, I don't wanna come off like I'm hating on hybrid join in terms of like its functionality and its place. But for me, its place is on your existing already deployed domain join machines. That makes total sense to do it there. On your machines that you're deploying net new or even refresh and redeploying, Azure AD join should be your first consideration. It should be the first thing you're looking at, the first thing you're trying. And you know you don't have to come out of the gate where every device is gonna be doing it until you've gone through the motions of understanding and, and configuring it. But if you're trying to do that net new deployment, Azure AD Join will not prevent you from accessing the existing corporate resources you have. It does not break your ability to monitor, uh, to manage and monitor those devices. In fact, if you have um, line of business dependencies 
on configuration manager is a really common one. People have uh, reporting structures or they have collections that do things like uh, inventory reporting and that sort of stuff. You can totally co-manage those devices with configuration manager and still do all those things that you're used to doing in configuration manager. The only thing that's changed is the identity relationship of the device with the domain. There's no problem in deploying configuration manager on an Azure AD Joint machine. You probably should if you've got that kind of investment in config man. So I think sometimes that's the other um, misunderstanding that people have is that, well, if we go Azure AD Joint, I can only manage them with Intune. Dude, that's not true. That's not how it works. You can manage the devices either or. You could actually have an Azure AD Joint machine that's only managed by configuration manager. I've never seen it. You can do it. I probably wouldn't <laughs> because <laughs> if you want to do things like access the, the device through the cloud management gateway, it's a lot easier to do that on an Azure AD join machine because you can do key-based authentication and don't have to issue certificates to your device to go through the CMG. So, hey, maybe that's another reason that you would deploy Azure AD join machines if you want to manage them with ConfigMan off net. CMG does that without having to deploy certificates to devices. So there, there's lots of advantages to, to simplify the deployment uh, of the devices. And it even gives people an opportunity to start considering you know, new ways of delivering um, content to the devices for the end users, right? I have some customers that they're kind of coming from the heavy handed um, pre-staging of content on the devices where they give the device to the end users with all 300 applications that might be available because they might use them. And they're taking this opportunity to deploy the devices with that core set of apps that all users should have. Well, all users in that set of, of user types. And then let them do more of a self-service just in time uh, without having to give the users local admin rights to install it because they can put them inside of their application catalog, either use their existing investment in configuration manager and co-management or put the applications in Intune and surface that application availability inside the company portal app. And in the company portal app, you can see Intune apps, configuration manager apps, and store apps, all as a user can click and, and install them. And the nice thing about that story is if you're using the company portal app as your way of provisioning or making available company sanctioned applications, that same app is on your mobile devices like your iOS and Android. So you can tell your users when you need an app, this is the place to go. It doesn't matter what device they're on. So one of the things uh, that I just want to make clear to our users too, to our listeners, is that, <laughs> is that uh, you know, there's, there's this spectrum, um, and we just touched on it really briefly in the beginning of the show, but you have your domain join machines on one end, and then hybrid Azure AD join, which is just really, like you said, Shannon, it's just one step up. Um, but it's still tied essentially to the domain. Mm -hmm. And then you have all the way on the other spectrum, you have completely cloud managed uh, Azure AD joined machines. Now we have this Azure AD joined machine also with uh, cloud management gateway or, or config man, right? And so that's kind of a step towards where you still have an on-premise uh, management. And as I was checking the, and maybe this was a new feature that was released at Ignite, or maybe I just haven't seen it in a little while, but uh, I was looking at some of the compliance policies for Windows 10, and there's actually a new toggle in Intune that says in your compliance policy, you could require yeah. a compliance policy for ConfigMan now. Yeah. So um, I, I don't know. I, I haven't seen that in, in a while. I, mean, I think it's maybe new or at least some Yeah, recent, well, it's been around for a cool. while. It, um, what that does is so... When you when you co-manage devices, you actually have these workload sliders. You've probably seen the you know three just three clicks or whatever it used to be called. the The idea was that when you have a device that's managed by both Configuration Manager and by Intune, you have two management channels on the device. Uh, configuration Manager is agent-based management, so it's basically an application or a process that's running in the system context, and so it has system-level access to all the goodies. Um, and then you have the new MDM channel, uh, which is a net new thing in, in Windows 10 that Intune can pull the strings on. Um, and, and when you have those two in place, both Intune and Configuration Manager, now that they're part of Endpoint Manager or MEM, uh, their co-management state basically can determine which one owns what. So you can say this workload is owned by this management uh, process, this workload is owned by that. And compliance is one of those workloads. Um, 
In my opinion, if you're doing co-management, you should absolutely slide that over to Intune. And Intune should be the thing that owns the compliance state of the device. And if you have any compliance settings or policies in Configuration Manager, then you go into Intune and you make a policy that says, uh, this compliance policy is also going to include or require the compliance attestment from Configuration Manager. So now your existing Configuration Manager settings for compliance carries over to Intune. It, it's a flag that basically says is or is not. But the fact that you can say Configuration Manager already knows if my devices are compliant, but I want to leverage that over in Intune as well, you can combine the two. And then you can start combining can, um, your compliance policies in Intune with conditional access policies. So you can require compliant devices to access resources and that compliance state is attested to by Configuration Manager and Intune if you want. Um, and then you can say, you can't get here, you're not compliant. Um, so you don't have to give it up. You actually get to combine those. That's one of the pretty interesting workflows. One of our questions that we got specifically is how do you transition from domain join or hybrid Azure AD join to yeah. Azure AD join, right? I know you've talked about, you know, just, just going and trying and joining it and that's great. But what if I'm a an organization, I got, you know, 10,000 devices that are domain join. How do I transition those to Azure AD join if that's what I want to do? Yeah. So that, that one actually is a good question because that is uh, going to be on the minds of all of the people for like, if I would go that route, how do I get there? Um, I, I do think that before you try and make that plan for doing the migration, you should try and see, um, you know, how either good or bad it is, you know, for your use cases and make that determination if making the change is going to be um, a significant effort or significant value for you. Once you've done it, I'm confident you'll see that it's a, it's a better experience in terms of deployment and management. Um, the question of how you migrate to that is really going to come down to uh, the, the use cases of the devices you're deploying. For the most part, people are looking at things like deploying devices with autopilot, which is a net new device deployment. You can be a device repurposing, um, but usually the best experience is going to be a new device refresh deployment. Um, it is not to say that it is impossible to um, move the device from one state to the other, because technically you can, just like a device comes in as a work group join machine and then you step up to domain join. Like think back on how you would traditionally deploy even older versions of Windows is you would boot the machine up, you would log in with the, uh, the first account and that first account would be a local administrator. And then that account would be used to join the domain with a new credential that's from the domain. That's, that's always how domain joined worked. In fact, that was a process that uh, could be done manually, but a lot of people will use like OSD or MDT or something to automate that process where there's still a local account that then uh, does the join to the domain. Now with Azure AD join, because that, process of joining Azure Active Directory can be done at the UBI, we actually don't have to create a local account. So you actually can do the joining process right out of box, literally UBI out of box, uh, and the device gets joined and there's no local account. So one major difference there that I hear a lot is like laps, right? If you're using domain join machines and you want the local administrator password solution, uh, that is relevant because in many cases you're using an automation that's creating like company admin account with the same password because of automation and now you want to rotate it and group policy takes care of that. Well, guess what? If you do Azure AD join and use autopilot, there's no local account to manage. You don't need it. You, you might have other reasons for things like that. And MMD actually developed a solution for creating local admin accounts for help desk and that kind of stuff. But it, it's not the, it's not something you need. Uh, anymore with Azure DJ machines because it's not part of the deployment process. Um, if you want to take those machines that are already deployed and move them though, technically, like, you know how you can leave a domain and join a new domain? Guess what? You, you technically, I'm not ad advising this, you can leave the domain and Azure AD join the machine, but that's not going to help you. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make a mess of things. So what's, what happens is, we talked about how the user uh, it has an account in AD in Azure AD. A domain joined machine signs in with the Active Directory user account. When you leave the domain, you then have to use a local account on the machine, and then you can join Azure AD, which will sign in with the Azure AD credentials. 
on Windows, it, the same username will be recognized, but Windows will know it's a different identity and create a whole new profile. So if you're trying to leave and rejoin and thinking you're going to save like your desktop and your fancy app installs and user preferences and all that sort of stuff, it's not going to happen. That's not how it works. There's no supported way to move user profiles from domain to Azure AD. There just isn't. So what do you do, right? One of the things that you can do is start adopting solutions that take user settings and store them in the application or service that they're related to. If you use things like OneDrive for Business, that's a great place for user to put their redirected folders or their known folder move in place. So desktop documents and pictures automatically get put into OneDrive. So if you enable that on your currently deployed machines, you've moved a lot of the user content into OneDrive. And then when you deploy the Azure AD into managed device, you turn that on, all that stuff comes back. And it uses files on demand, so it doesn't download their entire content. It makes it available for them when they need it. The next thing in, in many cases is use Edge. Like seriously use Edge. If you new, use the new version of Edge, if you're on 20H2, guess what? You get it. <laughs> it comes right out of the box. You don't even have to deploy it. You will be using the new version of Edge on Windows. Have your users use it. And sign into the browser, right? When you sign into the browser, um, if it's a hybrid join machine or an Azure AD join machine, it logs into that with an Azure AD identity and synchronize your stuff. When you synchronize things in Edge, you get all the stuff that is inside of Edge stored into your Azure AD identity. So when you sign into the browser on the next machine, your bookmarks come back, your saved passwords come back, your extensions come back. All that stuff that you've gone through to customize your browser experience is tied to your account and it signs back in. I, I literally deployed my machine on Tuesday. I got a new Surface Laptop 3, I'm all excited. And that was my experience. <laughs> I signed in, I'm like, oh, look at that. My extensions came back, my stuff is saved. Like it was, mm -hmm. it was great. Um, so do that. OneDrive known folder move, uh, Edge. And then on the administrator side, go into Azure AD and turn on Enterprise State Roaming. If you turn on ESR, some of the niceties that people want to have, like saved Wi-Fi networks and, and a variety of other th like desktop things and settings inside of uh, Windows, follow the user again in Azure AD. The user just signs in and they get it. So have a hybrid join machine, turn on known folder move, sign into the Edge browser and turn on ESR. And you'll have a lot of the user content that is in the profile is on the user account and will come back when they sign back in on the Azure AD machine. What that means though, is you're paving the box, right? You're gonna take that machine, you're gonna burn it down and redeploy it using hopefully something like autopilot. And then that will allow the user to sign back in and get the things reconfigured. And then what's on the, the administrator is how do you get the apps back to them? What apps do they need? What apps do they use? And that goes back to the conversation we had at the top uh, where we said, try the deployment, try the experience, figure out what they need, and then you can start experimenting with that reset, redeploy stuff. Because now you'll know uh, what is the user expecting when they come back in? What, what's missing? What is confusing? And what can you do to address it? Those needs are unique across industries, right? Every customer has different requirements and different experiences. Some of them are like, you know what, figure it out. <laughs> Other ones are like, I could not possibly give this to Tom. He would lose his mind if I gave it to him and he had mm -hmm. to figure out how to do this stuff. And so your needs and your tactics are going to vary, um, but they're addressable. And, and I think that the, if you look at the amount of work that it's going to take to figure that out, compare that to the amount of work people are trying to do just to do hybrid join. Mm -hmm. Work is work, right? You only have so much time in a day and time in a month or a year, I guess, if you go back to the start of COVID, uh, you only have so much time to, to do the work. And if you've been spending the year trying to do this, this hybrid joint autopilot stuff, I promise you'd be farther along if you started with Azure AD. Um, there are going to be scenarios that it's not going to fit, uh, but there are other scenarios that light up that you might not, we haven't even talked about, like autopilot self-deploy for kiosks and like digital sign usage and being able to, you know, have multi-app uh, kiosks for, for people to sign into. Like Azure AD join and Intune can totally do that and it does it like zero touch. It's, it's really cool stuff. Um, but I don't want to dig into that until people have just tried the user scenarios. So it's really neat. Yeah. You know, w one thing, I a point I think I've made on this show before, but if not, I'll make it again, <laughs> is that 
oftentimes we have a tendency as IT people to try to solve our needs first because, hey, we're the ones testing out, we're the ones doing it. But we are oftentimes the most complex use cases. We are the most challenging <laughs> users. We are the nightmare scenario. Don't like try to do your most complex user and then go, oh, this is too hard, forget it. Because you probably have vast populations of your org that are relatively straightforward. They literally need edge, they need OneDrive, and they need like one or two line of business apps. And that's mm -hmm. all they need. You know, Bob, Bob's out in the field, he's taking insurance claims, and he literally just needs our claims app and and Outlook, and he's yeah. good. So okay, solve that, because yeah. that's relatively straightforward. And then come back to the hard stuff later, as you get more reps, and you get more practice with the tooling. Yeah. Now you'll be better positioned to handle those esoteric and edge and weird use cases. But don't start with the hardest thing first, you wouldn't do that anywhere else in life. But IT people <laughs> have this tendency to try to solve their needs first. And oftentimes, we're really tough. Yeah, yeah, I do see uh, a lot of cases where people are uh, going down the path of, of considering this sort of deployment model and get really hung up on the exceptions. Um, there is a reason that options exist, right? Like it, you will likely find something that doesn't fit the scenario, but I do think you'll find a majority of devices um, have an opportunity to fit this model. Um, mm -hmm. And you're totally right, Adam. You really should be uh, finding your, your early adopter groups, um, the ones that have uh, that low um, configuration requirement that you can test and, and get your reps in, right? You know, do, do the work uh, on those first so that you know what you know uh, and then figure out what needs to be figured out. Uh, if you can do that, I think you're in a really good place uh, to start doing the deployment. So... For our security-minded folks, too, I want to mention, we talked about just going out and trying and, and Azure AD joining a machine, and then there's also a, some talk about autopilot. One mm -hmm. of the main key differentiators that I will kind of mention for especially security folks that are looking at device management is when you Azure AD join a machine and it's user-driven, you're automatically an admin um, for that uh, machine. If you autopilot something, then it's more of a device uh, management profile and you can set uh, that, you know, specific users or groups to be admins, or you can make it so that this profile, they are just users. And so that's, that's an important differentiator when you're going on and testing. If you find early adopter groups and you're in like a company like mine, where we actually don't allow our users to be admins, then autopilot is really the, the way that you want to test this. Now there is um, a setting in Azure AD where you can set a specific O365 group or Azure uh, group to have users be admins automatically added in. Like if you have a, an AD group like on-prem and you have like a help desk or support desk that they're added as local admins, you can do the same thing and replicate that in, in Azure AD as well for Azure AD joint devices. But yeah, that's a key differentiator. If you're going on and testing it and you're like, well, I'm just going to try it. There's really no harm in just getting the device enrolled in autopilot and just starting there because the settings are going to be the same. If you take a vanilla machine, enroll it in autopilot, right? And then go through that and you have no settings in Azure AD, it's going to do the join and pretty much give you the same thing, except for the fact that you could set that user to be a user and not a local admin. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's one of the, uh, uh, one of the reasons that if you do the deployment in kind of the order I talked about earlier, where you first get the device joined, then get the device managed, then go through the autopilot configuration. That's where you get to start dealing with users who are not admin and figuring out what do they need to do. So if you do the join, you're going to be local admin, right? So as a local admin on the machine, you can install the apps you're missing. You could install a certificate you might need to trust. You could go through and configure system settings that you might need to deal with. And that gives you the ability to get over the hump and use the device and find the rest of the things you need to figure out. Once you get to the point of actually doing the autopilot deployment, make yourself a standard user on the device and go through the process of how would I fix it if I couldn't do it? Right? What is the configurations that Intune's going to have to push to solve this problem? What apps do I need there? What apps do I need available? 
and then you can really build out those scenarios on uh, what you need to address. But you're, you're totally right. I probably should have mentioned that earlier that just joining the device to Azure AD will make you a, a local administrator out of the box, which actually is, is kind of what happens when you're uh, a local administrator on the machine and you've joined to Active Directory. You still have that local admin account you could always use, right? <laughs> and, and so people who are joining those devices have local admin access. And if you want to get rid of it, Azure AD Join has a pretty easy way of accomplishing that through autopilot. Oh, we should also talk about, you did mention about the other group for uh, device admins. There's a there's a, a role in Azure AD called device admins. Mm -hmm. And you can make any Azure AD user a member of that role, and they'll have local admin rights on Azure AD join machines. For some people, that's too broad. They don't want you know, their help desk to have access to all Azure AD Join machines. They want like people on East Coast to have East Coast admin, West Coast admin, right? Um, you can do that sort of thing in, in different ways. Um, but what I also see people doing is um, having things like just in time with Azure DP2, where they can like just in time add themselves to that group and there's an audit trail. So you can combine really new, uh, really cool new ways of, of accessing it. A lot of places have secondary admin accounts that they use too. So their help desk have their day-to-day -day account for mail, and then they have the help desk account they use to jump on people's machines to work with it. If those accounts have been synced out to Azure AD and they're members of that role, guess what? They got local admin. You can totally do that. Um, and just one quick plug for Quick Assist, one of my favorite things that's built into Windows that nobody knows about. If, if you want to do remote assistance on machines, hit start and type Quick Assist. That tool is there for you to easily uh, connect to each other's machines and actually share screen and, and do remote work. Um, and it ties into Azure AD identity. So you can start the app up, get on the phone with Help Desk, and Help Desk gives you a number. And when the end user types in the number, it says, you know, uh, Sally wants to help you out with your machine and they get some, some identity uh, on who's helping. So it, it's a really cool tool that's just built in for Help Desk that uh, allows you to do that remote, remote help without having to have firewall ports open or anything like that. So, Adam, do you have anything else before we wrap up the show? <laughs> I am uh, absorbing the tsunami of information from Mr. Shannon here. That was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it was. It's really been great. You know, as security professionals, I sometimes we wonder why we want to worry about device management and all this other stuff because this is, you know, people make it a career of of doing all of this stuff but really all the things that adam and i have talked about when it comes to conditional access and one of the things that i've struggled in my company is really how do you get a hold of people putting their data on their personal machines and if you're trying to manage an mdm solution when it comes to personal windows machines and company uh, windows machines that conditional access everything that microsoft has built for at least Intune requires, you know, the either it to be Azure AD join or hybrid Azure AD join. When it's a domain join machine and you start applying conditional access policies, you really start to get in trouble because it, it doesn't know that it's domain joined and, and uh, it can really conflict. So that's, you know, that's why I really immerse myself in de device management because it helps manage the data and the compliance of these machines when it's Azure AD join um, and hybrid Azure AD joint. But, you know, I think in this episode, we've gone through a lot of reasons why you should really consider Azure AD join as a, your next step. So Shannon, really appreciate you taking the time and coming on our show. This was mm -hmm. just outstanding information. I hope our listeners get a lot out of it. I know even for me, I've learned quite a bit just talking to you tonight. So thank you for coming on. Yeah, you bet. It's, it's one of my favorite topics to, to talk about is when uh, when I talk to customers about doing like autopilot, a lot of times they think that uh, hybrid joins are a requirement. It is not a requirement. It's an option. And mm -hmm. I don't think it's the best option. Um, it, it, it's it, I think that um, if, if you're going through that process of trying to decide if you should use Azure AD join, I think you should try it and you know go through that Ubi experience, join the machine. Uh, address the problems that you've, you've got there. And then if you have questions, 
go on Twitter and ask people like me, um, and, and we're happy to go through that process or get in, in touch with your account team and they'll connect you to people like fast track. Um, they can connect you to partners. There's, there's a bunch of people out there uh, that do have expertise and experience in these areas. And, you know, we're happy to, uh, be that, uh, that group to bounce questions off of. So come at us. We're here. To I, help. I, just adding on to what Shannon said, this is certainly an area of focus at Microsoft right now, and yeah. you will see more to come in this space as, as far as resources to help customers, because we recognize that sometimes all of these different options look like the menu at the Cheesecake Factory, where there's so many different choices and you don't know where to go. And, and certainly, I can say from a leadership all the way down, there's there's a recognition that customers need help understanding what their options are and what to do. And uh, definitely reach out to your account teams for help because it, it is a complex conversation, but hopefully we brought some clarity to it today. Okay. For our listeners, Shannon, uh, you want to list off some of the places that they can find you. You mentioned Twitter. Uh, what's your Twitter handle, uh, LinkedIn, and, and all the different things if uh, you, some listeners want to reach out and ask questions? Yeah, um, you you can find me on on Twitter. I'm just Mr. Shannon Fritz, uh, not Mrs. Hannon, like the whoever stole that handle from me. But uh, Mr. Shannon Fritz is is where you'll find me on Twitter. <laughs> That's probably the easiest way to, to find me publicly. Um, also, if if you're looking at anything for like uh, Microsoft Managed Desktop, uh, you'll find me there too, because <laughs> I'm doing a lot of the customer deployments in that space. Um, but yeah, you, you'll find me in there. I also uh, have a blog. If you just search me up. Uh, on uh, on the internet, you'll find a blog post there, which I think you said you'd link people to. It's it's probably the one of the longest posts that I, I wrote accidentally. Um, I literally meant to post a, a matrix that showed device identity compared to device management and how they cross over each other and what is and is not possible. And after I wrote that, I got so many questions like, oh man, I got to describe each of these steps. So if you're looking for like the fundamentals on what's what, how it works, what its relationship is, that blog post will give you that. Um, And if you have any questions, you can always post on there too. And I'm I'm happy to respond publicly to that or or privately if you want to hit me on Twitter or something. That's our show for this week. Thanks for listening. Our contact info will be in the show notes. If you have any follow-up questions or comments on the episode, thanks. And we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.